Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our risen and living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The, uh, the contemporary Christian song, Rock of Ages, echoes the message from, our, uh, from the prophet Isaiah from our Old Testament reading today. You might be familiar with those lyrics. There is no rock, there is no God like our God, no other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, he's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. And truly, there is no God like our God, who is worthy of all our praise. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. There is no God like our God. And in the context of the Israelite exile into Babylon to which the uh, to whom the prophet Isaiah is speaking here uh, they, they found themselves in a seemingly uh, helpless situation uh, they were uh, exiled uh, into Babylon because of their own idolatry they had turned away from their God and because of that uh, they were cast into exile And so this message here from the Lord to his people was a tremendous affirmation to them. A reminder to them of just how great their God is. Even though that uh, they were no longer with an earthly king, a Davidic king, God here reminds them that he is their rightful king who rules over all things. He is their Redeemer, who has come to buy them back and rescue them from their exile in Babylon. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of armies, who will come and conquer and destroy their enemy. He is the first and the last. He has no creator, no beginning. No one has created him out of human hands, but he is the one who has created all things. And in the end, he will be the one who alone stands as his people uh, let their future lie in his hands and his hands alone. There is no God like our God. But just like those Israelites who were in exile, we too find ourselves in a helpless situation. As, our, as Paul wrote to, to the Romans, uh, boy, do those words ring true to us. How great are our sufferings today that even the earth, uh, all of creation groans out with suffering. Uh, too deep for words. We too find ourselves in a seemingly helpless situation position, all brought on by our own idolatry. Now Israel, they had turned their back on God. They had begun to worship idols of their own creation, worshiping the false gods of the heathen nations around them. They had disbelieved in their God and turned away from him, and as a result, their nation was destroyed. They were taken into exile, held captive by the Babylons. And they were cast out from that land that God had so graciously promised to give to them. Now, maybe our idols aren't like the heathen idols of the Babylons, uh, the Babylonians, uh, fashioned out of wood and, and stone, cast out of out of metal, but the gods that we have are still the gods, the false gods of our own creation. In the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, God tells us that all of humanity was created in his image. In the image of God, he created him. But in our sinfulness, 
we too have turned uh, our back on God. We have completely turned that upside down, gotten it completely backwards in creating God in our own image, making God out to be what we want God to be. We've created kind of a Burger King type God, having it our way, picking and choosing what we like and what we don't like. Uh, And sometimes these gods are made out of material things, but sometimes these gods are created out of the imagination of our own mind, created out of uh, our uh, our own thoughts, our own desires, our own ideals. And so we've created gods who like what I like. We've created gods who hate what I hate. Gods who think the way that I think. Gods who, uh, who share in my opinion and in my point of view. And we've created gods who increase our standard of living, who increase our happiness, who increase our comfort, who increase our conveniences. We've created gods who give me what I want when I want them. Gods created in my own image. Now, when I was uh, when I was in uh, college at Concordia Saint Paul, one of my uh, professors was teaching a a night class for non-traditional students. And at Concordia's, uh, all students are required to. Uh, take some sort of religion class, and, and this was a kind of an introductory to religion or introductory to Christianity class. And, uh, and with this night class filled with non-traditional students, there were some uh, LCMS Lutherans, Christians from other denominations, uh, some non-believers probably as well. And, and so the professor at the beginning of the class, he would ask them to, uh, to define who God is to you. Uh, who is God? What is God? And when they'd give, his, uh, give them his answers, it was all sorts of different answers. God's created in their own image. And so he said that one of his goals in teaching this intro to, uh, to religion class was to destroy their concept of God. To destroy those gods who were created in their own image. And Martin Luther, uh, he teaches in the in the Lord uh, the large catechism regarding the first commandment of "You shall have no other gods." Luther says, uh, "What this means is that whatever you set your heart on, and whatever you put your trust in, that is truly your God." Whatever you set your heart on and put your trust in is truly your God. Now we can certainly pick on on many of those false gods that we've created, those easy ones like uh, money or power, success. But what if your God looks like your health? Or what if your God looks like the Democratic or Republican parties? Or what if your God looks like this country or the media outlet that fits into your agenda, into your perspective, uh, proclaiming your narrative? Or what if your God looks like sports and entertainment? Or what if your, fam- uh, what if your God looks like your family? Or maybe your God is having things normal. Or your God is conveniences. Now, many of these things are good and gracious gifts from God. God gives us health. He gives us government. He gives us money. And these are all good things when they're used for his purposes. These are good and gracious gifts. But whatever you set your heart on, And put your trust in is truly your God. And so when we make these things out to be our God, these things that we set our hearts on, that we put our trust in, that's when we begin to have problems and these become evil things. Now, uh, Pastor Levi, uh, he's uh, observed and recognized that 
Uh, Sometimes people will make comments of, as long as I've got my health. As long as I've got my health, then I'm perfectly content and happy. No matter what's going on, as long as I've got my health, things are okay. No matter how bad it gets, as long as I've got my health, we're good to go. As long as I've got my health. But what happens if you don't have your health? What happens if you don't have your political party? What happens if you don't have your country, your family, your sports, your job, your entertainment, your bank account, your normal, your conveniences? Then what happens? Well, if these things are your God, if these are the things that you set your heart on and put your trust in, if you have made these your God, then you have nothing. All of these things just lead to anger and frustration and disappointment and despair, and ultimately, we're hopeless. And so the Lord God challenges these false gods of Babylon. He challenges the, the false gods and the idols of our own creation when he says, Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Let him declare what is to come and what will happen. Here God is challenging and mocking those false gods of Babylon, and he is mocking those who follow these false gods because these false gods are nothing. They can't do anything. They are made out of human hands, created out of human minds. They aren't real. They're powerless. And so what happens when you don't have your health, your politics, your country, your job, your normal, your conveniences? What happens when you don't have any of these things? Well, fear not. Be not afraid. There is, is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. The Lord alone is the one who, uh, to whom Israel may put their trust. The Lord God is the only one upon whom they can build their future. Rock of ages. Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages. Jesus is the rock. And if we still haven't gotten it, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Jesus is our rock. He is our God. He is the firm foundation upon, uh, upon which we stand and live our lives in whom we put our trust and build our future. Now, rocks are useful things in times of trouble. They provide safety and protection. We might think of those words, a mighty fortress is our God. And in our troubled times, Jesus is our God. He is our rock who provides that that protection and that safety, who gives us that firm foundation to stand on. There is no God like our God. Jesus is our God. He is our King who rules and reigns over all things, who graciously cares for his people, who provides for his subjects. Jesus is the one who gives us all that we need to live and support this life, to enjoy this life. And when all of those things have been taken away from us, when we don't have the things that we need for this life, guess what? He gives us something even more. He gives us his forgiveness, his life, and his salvation for us. There is no God like our God. Jesus is our God. He is our Redeemer who has bought us from the exile of our sin. 
buying us not with silver and gold, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Through his death on the cross and the blood shed for you there, he has set you free from that bondage of sin. Setting you free to, uh, to live joyfully in this life. Setting you free to serve God and to lovingly serve our neighbor. There is no God like our God. Jesus is our God. He is the Lord of hosts who has come to conquer and destroy our enemies of sin, death, and Satan. And he has promised that he is going to come again with a final victory on the last day as Revelation chapter 22, the final book of the Bible, reminds us. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Just like God had promised his people centuries before to the exiles in Babylon, reminding them that he is the first and the last and there is no God like your God. There's no God like our God. No God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. For only our God creates, uh, has created his creation out of love for his creation. Only our God is great, uh, has graciously sacrificed himself to uh, redeem you, and rescue you, to save his people. Only our God humbles himself even to the point of death, death on a cross, humbling himself as a servant to serve you. Only our God holds us together in that true faith that we have a sure and certain hope, even in the midst of troubling times, because we have the sure promises that he has given to us. And there is no other God that can do these things. There is no God like our God. Amen.